African Ascent International has been away from the uh, airwaves for about a month now. We're back to the swing and we're going to entertain you and bring you first-rate composers such as the great uh, legendary Julius Williams of Berkeley College of Music, Prince Charles Alexander, Carrie Carrington, Dylan and Patricia, Dad Diallo, Dalio and Patricia, and many, many others. Today, uh, uh, Alan Levines, uh, I shouldn't forget the Biggies and Maximus, <laughs> have all treaded uh, the floors of Afghanistan International, but this particular um, show is going to be a, a, about a very uh, a unique and uh, and tantalizing theme in the musical landscapes um, of the territories uh, that um, musicians cover. At length, I will be looking forward to um, interview Mr. Williams uh, to give us a um, course, really, on what it is that uh, composers and uh, conductors do. Because the research, as I surveyed it, uh, tends sometimes to unnecessarily draw rigid differentiations between conducting something and composing it. Uh, for example, as the great uh, Bernstein does it, because when you watch uh, Bernstein, you're not merely looking at a conductor who is performing a musical piece written by others, because he, he himself is also a composer, but also composing as he's conducting. So I think I'm going to ask uh, uh, Mr. Williams, whose uh, um, uh, achievements are really legion uh, among many, many uh, of his accomplishments. He is the first, I think, um, black um, president of the Conductors Guild. Uh, he's also a, a, guest, a guest curator, um, as he is a cover conductor uh, for the great uh, Boston Pops, our own Boston Pops. He's an artistic director. Um, he has guest conducted in numerous occasions and at numerous places. Um, he is also um, a member, um, uh, a composer in, uh, in residence at the Boston Symphony Orchestra. I could go on and on and on, um, but um, I'll stop right here and there. And uh, what I would like us to begin, um, what is bound to be a very rich uh, conversation about music, is to talk about uh, first composition. And then conducting, and then composition and conducting themselves. And then Mr. <laughs> Williams himself will talk about what it is that he does when he's conducting and uh, composing. Welcome to African Ascent International for the first time, Mr. Uh, Mr. Williams. And uh, my guests and I are looking forward to really have a festivity um, on music with you. Well, thank you, thank you. The, uh, it's a uh, a kind of interesting, always fun to talk about uh, composing and conducting, and and what I like to get across that there are some people who are conductors, and there's some people who are composers, and then there's some people that cross both boundaries, and to get to get to, to familiar what the difference is, I believe. A conductor has to look at somebody's music and and interpret that music the way they themselves see uh, see seeing wanting it perform. But a composer just writes music for what he perceives is from his own self. But he's not a conductor, so he doesn't know how it's going to be performed. So it's a kind of interesting category. I'm, I'm mixing you up a little bit, but let me start. As a composer, composers take something uh, and and puts it together. Um, they take, uh, they come up with an idea, and they use musical 
um, sounds, um, harmonies, anything to create uh, a, a story or create a soundscape from what they they've come up with. Uh, they don't have any aspirations to perform it. They would like it to be performed, but they really don't know what it's really going to sound like. Now, today we have Finale and Sibelius that will play back what you've written, but even this does not give you, uh, you know, a, a clear sound of what it's going to be. So your imagination, a composer is somebody's imagination that takes the material to create something or a line. But a conductor, it's it's a different situation. I may, I take your material and I try to make it alive. And what you gave me is what I'm I'm trying to do with it. I can make, make it simple. I can make it go faster. I can make it go slower. I can uh, you know change the how loud or soft it is. I can. Um, um, with accents or declamations at points, I can, um, you know, add my own idea to your musical um, idea, but I didn't create the music. And, you know, th there's two defenders of things. Sometimes they're both in the same, but most of the time they're two different entities. Mm. And now uh, let uh, let's talk about uh, composition itself. Uh, please um, forgive my ignorance. I know nothing uh, uh, about composition. What do composers do exactly? Um, give me a step by step introduction um, <laughs> to what um, a composer does. Uh, let me one, let me yes. Let me kind of uh, let me take on. Um, Something that just happened to me recently. Uh, the the uh, Boston Symphony wanted me to start it out with not the Boston Symphony. Boston wanted me to write something for the uh, the monument, the Civil War monument of African American soldiers. Um, uh, it's called the Fifty Regiment Monument in Boston, and they came to me and said, "You know, we would like a a, a composition." to 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 feature this this or to give us a sound of this particular piece and can you do that and then they came to me and said well we have a children's choir that would love to perform the piece and we have a viola player and a trumpeter that would like to be part of this and we'll give you this money my job is then to figure out well what is this about um, I have to come up with words for it because I'm using the choir. I have to come up with a sound, and I'm thinking about a you know military sound or a sound that that needs to be made. And I have to add a viola to give some kind of um, color to this piece. So it's they give you parameters, and from that parameters, then you start to think of the musical sound. You know, so I go. You know, in my case, many times I just imagine what that would be and start coming up with ideas. Most of the time, the first thing I come up with is is the rhythm or something, a rhythmic kind of structure. And it's it's very important because African music has, you know, it's based upon rhythm, a lot of rhythm, and many times more intricate than any Western music that happens. But rhythm, I come up with a rhythm that will reflect, you know, what what the rhythm will be. And then I, I go from that point on is think of, you know, a melody or an idea, a melody of some notes, a groups of notes that I put together, and I begin to, to come up with a melody that would signify that composition, and we probably call it some kind of theme some kind of melody theme that will reflect what I'm writing. And from that point on, then I think of to fill it in with color and concept. So I may think of the chordal structure of the piano, or I may 
play, you know, a, a thing on guitar or marimba or something that can give me um, the chords underneath. And from there, it's it's up to me to come up with the piece. And then one of the other things, how long is the piece? That's the next thing I gotta figure out. How much music is needed in the piece? All these things are in the parameters of what I have to think before I do anything. I think of these parameters and then I, you know, from there, then I begin to create the piece. Um, what makes it particularly hard sometimes is if something to do with voice and something that I have to either find the poet or find somebody who will, who will come up with lines, who will make lines, uh, you know, the words actually reflect the musical sound. So I have to figure out what it, you know, what language it is and which change it, it changes the sound just from the from some from the texts that are being done. So those are some of the parameters. Usually I'm saying it, but it, it it's harder than it is. But at the same time, it's easy. Yeah, I mean, it's like painting a picture using using um, the materials around you. Uh, musical materials that is mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how long did it take you to uh, produce this uh, particular composition it all depends you know i'm saying writing a symphony but in this particular instance this was, i wrote this piece for the pa pandemic uh, during the pandemic so i was able to they also gave me uh specific parameters they wanted the piece to be seven to nine minutes so I knew that the piece was seven to nine minutes, but it took me, you know, a couple of months uh, to really um, come up with the idea. You know, I started sketching ideas down and I would walk around Berkeley sketching ideas, singing tunes, um, coming up. And then once I do that, then I start, um, you know, putting it together. It's like building a block. You come up with some ideas and then you put more and more and more. But it's like, you know, building, I would say, in that sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in your judgment, uh, I'll break it, uh, this into several pieces. How do you determine uh, artistic greatness in composition? What are the determining characteristics of greatness? You know, that's quite interesting because I was just saying that greatness is like anything. If you're an artist looking at a picture, sometimes it's in the eyes of the beholder, but sometimes greatness is is if if it moves you. Sometimes the worst pieces could be could be great pieces. For example, uh when Stravinsky wrote The Rite of Spring. You know, they went, you know, they went to hear this and people were in the audience booing. They were throwing things. They were saying, this is the most awful piece of, uh, of music that could be written. And then it turns out it was one of the great pieces of the 20th century. Well, that says what greatness, artistic greatness is if it affects you emotionally. If it affects you emotionally, physically, uh, or it really, uh, if it really creates a violent uh, effect, many times there's something to that composition that is reflects that idea of greatness. Greatness also, uh, uh, you know, I get on my students here at Berkeley, they sometimes think, even in the Grammy Awards, sometimes great that greatness is how many records you sell, or how many, or how many people have heard it. That's not greatness. Greatness is affecting um, these people. Do they have an interest? Do do they retain it? Do they say the, the do they walk around singing that melody, or do that affect them many different ways in their uh, physical and social? Um, habits or in life, so I believe the, the if I can put one word on greatness, it would be is has it an emotional effect that could be good 
and or bad and which which really sends you to thinking about you know other pieces in that genre or 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 pieces in general mm -hmm. the great um, russian writer uh, tolstoy mm -hmm. who himself uh, was an artist wrote this piece that i use in my aesthetics course on what art is in which it contends art is something that is performed by an artist and as the artist is performing it the output of his performance should be distinguished by one clarity two sincerity three individuality and in the end he said a work of art is great to the in, to the extent that it infects you like a virus <laughs> <laughs> and and those are very important words you said, which is really breaks down what I said even better. You know, even my wife is Russian, I still don't know the the. Uh, but I, uh, Toy Story, uh, th that's exactly right. What he says, the individuality of the piece, which reflects who you are, and I believe everybody has an individual. It. it in today's time, some problems come up is because they start using um, the software and you start using uh, programs like Finale and Sibelius and you start uh, creating things like it. You, it's like using a word processor, pasting and taking things from other things and putting it together which then really loses that individuality that you said. It's not individual, you're just taking, borrowing. But somebody who's a, who a good composer, I should ask, is somebody that you, you recognize that individual's ability by their creativity. You, if we mentioned Bernstein earlier, you know the first few notes that, that is played by any of his pieces, you know that's Leonard Bernstein. Mm -hmm. So that the, the 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 creativity part and the individuality part is important. You know, you begin to create your own voice, and your voice is is I believe what makes you know uh, you're a good composer. My own voice. Sometimes I see pieces that I can't stand. My own pieces, and then sometimes I say, "Oh, that's really good." But the bottom line is is the artistic um, connection, artistic emotional connection, mm. which is, is the bottom line. If you have the artistic emotional con connection, which translates into somebody else feeling or understanding that artistic emotional connection, that tells me that you you are you know, a wonderful artist and able to really uh, create something that affects people and changes their mood. Incredible. We can liken this now, uh, if you like, uh, because you're also a professor of music um, at Berkeley College of Music, to teaching, I think. Because what I'm observing uh, is that great teachers are not great only because they could deliver perfect lectures. Because under suitable conditions, any human being, I think, could be trained to deliver a lecture, I think. The teachers whom I think become great, as in the artistic situation, are teachers who manage almost miraculously to establish emotional connections with their students.
which is often expressed, I think, in the form of compassion, care, attention, empathy, respect, and most importantly, I think, mindfulness. Is well, that also the it, case in music, uh, do you think? Uh, you know what? Uh, I, 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 what you said is uh, you can't, that's why music is such an interesting thing because the musicians connect to you in a different way. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they really, you know, they're all around me. They run me ragged sometimes. <laughs> they'll come to me. They want to find out the interest. They're part of, because their emotional connection is music. And mu music is, in order to make music, you have to have an emotional connection. You have to have some type of uh, connection. In fact, is such a strange, you know, that emotional connection probably deals more with my conducting part of the music because it's a kind of like a magical thing. Mm -hmm. I can feel things going wrong before I even hear them call. It's like I have a connection when it's going right. It's like I can pull strings and have like I'm holding on a string and pulling it and controlling it. When it's going wrong, it seems like something is cutting the string. And but that's not just hearing the sound. That is a connection, that, that musical connection. I don't even know how to describe it, but it's a very important to be a musician, you have to be able to um, to have that uh, musical emotional connection through you know of uh, uh, making sound and it's like being a teacher you, you know you have a a great student and if you can't connect with that student no matter what information you give them is that is that gonna do any good you could say on the other hand you have a connection with and they may not even know but if they you have the connection they begin to absorb and listen and and absorb the information. So uh, there's a qu question where it comes that, it, it, you know, uh, to be a teacher and to be a conductor is like, is probably like the same thing in, in many instances, to be a good teacher and be a good conductor. Okay. And now let's talk about uh, great composers. Now that you have them um, very uh, movingly, uh, to my satisfaction, uh, uh, defined uh, what greatness is up to a degree. Who are the composers whom you think are great and why? There are some really uh, great composers. I can even go... Um, you know, I could keep on going. You know, uh, there's a composer you may not know, African American composer. His name is Coleridge Taylor Perkinson. Perk was the one of the great. He may not be famous, but he was a brilliant, and he had a sense of of that emotionality in the music. Uh, but when I go back, let's talk about Western music because I can't say so much about uh, uh, some of the other cultures which have some great pieces that I've even done, but I still would uh, need to really make the connection. But obviously, Beethoven, because the music really reflects the emotion. When you hear a Beethoven uh, composition, you know it's Beethoven. You can't, and, and it will... It will make you know it was his his ability to make you um, connect to the music is so strong, and you know we we talk about Mozart, and, and and many people were writing a lot like Mozart, even black composers like Joseph Bologna was written in a time wrote in a time a time of Mozart. He was a composer and he was the greatest swordsman of, of Paris. And he was an African, he was uh, African uh, French. And he toured all over Europe with his orchestra. 
uh, in the 1700s, around the same time as Mozart was going. And he, of, of course, he didn't have the audience that, that Mozart had, and he didn't have, you know, growing, up, going under royalty. His father brought Mozart to various kings and, they, and performed for him. So he had a connection. But his music is very connection when you uh, to me when you hear something like the the Mozart Requiem or one of uh, his other pieces. But there were many composers. Uh, Leonard Bernstein had a wonderful connection. He had that musical connection, and he had that uh, Jewish musical sound that was able to transcend and 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 really was able, he listened to Tin Pan Alley and various composers, black composers at that. Um, you know, Scott Joplin, I can even name it, Scott Joplin was, was you know, a wonderful pianist. He always wanted to be a composer. And he actually wrote two operas, one called um, uh, Trimonitia, which we know, and the other... Um, um, called uh, was lost. It's called the um, I can't remember the name, but they lost that opera. But he always wanted to to write uh, because he studied again with with um, classical people like uh, Antonin Dvorak from the Czech Republics. So I, it's hard for me to say because there's so much music that were you know I would be naming composers. <laughs> You know, but it would be going. Bach is important to me because of his ability to write counterpoint and the number of pieces he wrote. Uh, you know, working for a church, he wasn't famous. His kids became famous, but all he did is write. A, you know, cantata every week. Um, he would write these uh, amazing works with with amazing counterpoint. So, you know, he, he's a building block. But like I said, it's so hard to to name one. I could be going all through, you know, through time. Of course, all my African-American composers who had tremendous um, abilities, like Ulysses K., who was once my teacher, who was the, like the dean, William Grant Still. Florence Price, who's now known, but there were many composers. Will Marion Cook, who wrote for Broadway and television, uh, not to broad, television, <laughs> Broadway. He was one of the first Broadway composers to uh, write uh, um, on Broadway. In fact, he wrote his first piece was called In the Homey for uh, So uh, it would be hard to say one composer, but I, I listen to the composers whose style, concept, and what actually makes me move emotionally. That's what I consider greatness. Mm -hmm. I have several questions to follow. I don't think an hour is going to be enough. Mm -hmm. Let me begin crowding them uh, slice by slice. Mm -hmm. I'm so curious. I mm -hmm. want from you. Now, uh, what is it that you do as a composer uh, to, 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 to establish what you call emotional connection with the audience what is the technique well, I'm sure there is a technique it, it's really no technique but the the trick is is that you you don't want to be writing for the audience but you want the audience to connect to what you're writing when you started writing for the audience or writing, then you're basically writing commercial music. You want to be commercial. You got to write something for the audience to watch or the audience to see or the that's a commercial and that and that's been done. Okay, I need to write this tune or if I'm writing a TV show, I need to write this this tune so it is pleasing to the audience, pleasing to the ear. But you want to be a composer that that when the audience listens to it, it reflects the, the the emotionality of the music from their perspective. But you're not writing for them. You start writing for them. Like I said, there's two different types of writing. You can write for somebody that commissions you or somebody to write for a, a specific project. Then you may be writing for them. Or for a television, you may be writing for them. 
But in this case, as a as a pure concert music composer, I don't write for them. I'm writing to make the the sound of what I need. I'm writing to get across the sound that they be emotionally uh, affected. And that's the two different things. And and both of them are very valid. Incredible. Now, um, uh, let me personalize this somehow. Uh, one of your colleagues uh, in, the, uh, in your department, uh -huh. uh, Lou Stewart, who have been honored to have had um, as a student, as uh -huh. a professor student, in my um, philosophy courses, mm -hmm. in all my philosophy courses, uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Once told me in response to a question that I asked him in my aesthetics course, uh, what kind of music do you write? He answered me, I only write what I like. That's a, a, interesting. I know Lewis. Lewis is a little, yeah. But that's an interesting question. It's not, I don't, oh, some of the pieces I don't, I have pieces that I don't like. <laughs> I have pieces that I, I don't even perform myself. I, I, oh, I hate that piece. You know, it, it you write pieces that you are, uh, or that you have a stake in. Mm -hmm. Now, you may not know by the end of the piece what it's exactly going to be. Sometimes these I'm going when they first came to me for this. I'm I'll talk about this project with this um, this uh, viola piano. You know, they came to me and they said, uh, "We want you to write a piece for viola, uh, trumpet, and 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 uh, viola, trumpet, and and." and um children's chorus and piano and i'm saying i don't want to write a piece for viola trumpet and children's chorus. what is that i'm not i'm not doing that you mm -hmm. know i'm not writing that piece uh, you know my wife said go ahead julius write that and i said I'm, i don't feel like writing this piece and they would pay me money. i don't care how much money I'm not gonna... finally she convinced me to go and write the piece part of it i think because it was so challenging. I had to figure out, what can I do with a children's choir? And, you know, what is that? So, um, you know, and it turned out very well. You know, I'm watching on YouTube and going like, oh, yeah. Uh, so you don't know what you actually are, wh what the outcome of the piece. Be. So the, for me to say that I only write for what I like is not true. It's is what makes me connect. What is connecting? That is true. What connect? I don't write for, for you know, for for the public. I write for the public, but I'm not thinking about the public. I'm thinking about how to make this these words, these lines, and these uh, you know, it's like writing a novel, trying to write the uh, you know how to make it work and how to to write something so people understand or get a, uh, 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 you know, or have an emotional connection with or some type of, like, I can't stand the piece. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, I like the piece. That too. So you're trying to create, uh, you know, the the effect and the best get it a form and get uh, uh, out there, you hope. And you don't really know what it is. You, you until it's actually performed. So it's possible then sometimes to compose a piece, um, as you said, um, about which you know nothing uh, other than uh, the fact that you can, and then it is only after it's produced that you know whether you like it or not. Yeah, that's true. And it's many, not just possible, most of the time you go... And, and and that the conducting part is another strange thing because you can write the piece. The piece is just no matter what you say, the piece is just like a roadmap. It's like writing words on the page. It doesn't mean anything until it's acted. If you were putting in a, a, the example, it doesn't mean that the words are there. And then you say. I want you to go and read this and act this out. Then it's a whole nother ball game. 
how to make this how to express what was written on that page uh -huh. and that's mm -hmm. completely different so you know i've seen composers of conductors a uh, composer and uh, comp as a conductor i was going to say who will come and bring me a piece and they've written it and they got all the stuff and they even know what it sounds like but when they bring it to it, they actually don't know it because it's a different genre from having something on paper or even something kind of you put in a computer to um, and to actual perform because that's a whole different genre. Okay. And now, um, do you believe in um, perfecting your compositions or uh, do you sometimes submit to a piece that was just given to you. You did not even know where the idea came from. And once you're visited by the idea, as it were, you don't even have to draft it because it came to you almost perfectly as a gift. <laughs> you know what? I, I believe partially, you know, Mozart, people would say you would go Mozart and because he, ha he has very few sketches. You can't even find sketches. So whatever Mozart wrote, he wrote it out. It was already done. He figured it out all in his head. It was already done. Beethoven had tons and tons of script sketches. Yeah. Ske sketchbooks with you know writing it over and over in different ways and so forth and so on but Mozart had none of that it was just like there so there must be something to that myself no it doesn't work that way myself is I might get and it's happened I've gotten ideas I've gotten fragments of ideas but it usually takes me a while to work it out. Sometimes the ideas are so okay. I got it, and I, and it can pretty go pretty fast. But I don't think this has a piece where it's just there, and I'm just playing it. That that usually never happens. And usually, if even if it did, I would end up looking and try to you know perfect that piece. So you know, uh, but I guess there's some people. Maybe Mozart is the only one that I know that. He, whatever he wrote was that was it. <laughs> it was no no you know no manuscripts, nothing. Though. Okay, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Now, there is a similar uh, description of the way the, uh, the the great painter Van Gogh produced. If you look very closely at any Van Gogh piece, it appears as if it was done only once. Right which is consistent with what you just taught me, namely uh, that the ideas that Van Gogh was painting were percolating and maturing in his brain, God knows for how long. And by the time he sat down, with the brush and the paint, he would, I was told, only do one movement. He does not go back to correct it. The first movement, the first brush is it. Is it. <laughs> that is the movement. <laughs> the work is done. And that is, that has never happened to me yet. But I could say that I've, got you know somebody said something and all of a sudden i just come up with ideas and it comes and i'm just right away then when i walk away from it i'm going like what did i do before why did i do it before some people have wonderful memories um uh, not like me i said okay let me write that down because when i come back i won't remember what i just did and maybe there's something within in that is that you you do come, the first inspiration will come to you and you're able to put it down on paper. Maybe I am, 
but I, it hasn't happened yet. It's been a while, so I'm waiting. But I think inspiration needs to be worked, like you, a writer, or uh, you know, they they write drafts and different drafts. I think that is the majority of composers. And now we're going to move to conducting. And this is how I structured the interview in my mind. <laughs> what do you like about conducting? Well, the, the thing that conducting is kind of interesting is you have a lot of power. Conducting, you have so much. You are in control. In my instance, I conduct the orchestra. So I'm in control of all the sounds, all the power, all the tempos, all the dynamics all the way it will be formed all the everything so in the ambience of sound so forth and so on so it's you that's why they invented the word maestro and and that's what you are you are master of of counterpoint of of melody of line all these different things uh you have control so i think most people who want to be a conductor is that control, controlling factor. You know, most people, it's, it's but in, in my case, it's more than that, is to, is to communicate the, the music that I want to get across. Also, is the, 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 in my case, I really like to, to bring uh, my fellow African Americans the music to, to, um, um, of these composers who've written in the style because they haven't had the chance to hear some of their pieces perform. Now that we have a movement of of this movement of diversity, trying to, you know, a lot of other people all of a sudden they want to try to do things that, you know, that I have been doing for 20 and 30 years. But, you know, I think that was the first thing is to be able to, to bring the sounds and interpret what I want from the music that I that I love. Mm -hmm. uh, let me ask you uh, this um, controversial question: Why aren't you the conductor of the Boston Symphony, considering how great you are? Well, that's uh, you know that's in the eyes of the beholder. But the the other thing is that. I'm with Isaiah Jackson, who who just retired from Berkeley. He's an emeritus professor. Where Isaiah was um, conducted all the major symphonies. He was uh, um, he he was here at Berkeley for um, fifteen years. He um, he um, he um, was um, the first at Tanglewood conductor under Le uh, Leonard Bernstein. He was so forth, but you know they wouldn't let us be in front of the orchestra for a long time. It's just recently we had James the priest and fairy and a few other conductors who were doing it, but they still, it was, uh, um, not to have an African American who would basically what I said before is in charge and is actually in charge of music that in, in their mind, it was from their heritage or their culture. Why are you conducting this? You are not conducting. So that has been the big, big um, problem. You know, we just, um, James the Priest was the first one. He had the Oregon Symphony, you know, 20 years, years ago he died. But we have no other African-Americans um, uh, major conductors that got a major symphony. Calvin Simmons was the conductor of the Oakland Symphony, and he was in a mysterious accident, which knocked him out. But and we just, just this past month, have a, you know the music director of the Baltimore Symphony is an African American, and you know there's this movement that went on that they need to diversify the orchestra after the George Floyd situation and it's and it's it's coming you know they're you know they're conducting the bbc proms african-american guest conduct so things are changing but you know during my period it was hard for them to even uh let me um get in front of an orchestra in fact and you can pull up a um um 
um, CBS Sunday Morning. Um, there's an interview on like in 1988 when I talked about where I wanted to be a major conductor. It was on national television um, speaking about, you know, um, I could be one of the great conductors of the time. But that was in 1988 and 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 they still marginalized me. And at that point, there was maybe a few of us, Michael Morgan, um, you know, um, uh, James the Priest. Few, there was a few conductors out there, but we were not uh, seriously considered for any of those larger orchestras. Things are changing. I want to see how well it does, though. Well, uh, we should congratulate you uh, for being the first mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. African American president of the mm -hmm. Actors Guild. Mm -hmm. That is a major, major accomplishment. Well, it's good. Uh, you know, I became the, you know, of the International Conductors Guild, I became um, the president. In fact, there's not uh, of all these major conductors around the United States and in, in Europe. Um, it's, it's been interesting. Um, you know, Many of the conductors, part of the Conductors Guild, weren't even allowed to be in the upper echelon of the organization. But um, I don't know how I got through. They, <laughs> they, the conductors started following me and saying, "You know what you're doing," and and um, and and it's a good thing. Incredible. Now, two more questions, and then and, and we'll, we'll we'll call it um, an end for now. But I'm going to bring you over and over again to give us a, an annual report on the state <laughs> of the when available. And I am intrigued by what I saw uh, once when Bernstein was conducting. I felt as if, although he was apparently conducting, it appeared to me as if he was composing also. Well, a little bit was an interesting, interesting individual. A little bit who was a good conductor. I don't think he was the greatest conductor, but Bill, but his ability to make music was a different. He had the his his whole concept was making music you know he was his he, you know he technically was not the best but he had music flowing within himself and in a way he was composing which he was he, I would say compose I think he was more interpreting the way he felt his life he was interpreting the lines and he had this great they they I would go to a I remember one Leonard Bernstein rehearsal I went to with the New York Philharmonic, and he would come in, kiss this girl, get that guy, get he'd be kissing, hey, hollering across the room. You know, everybody else would be ready to start. He'd be just talking, and and then when he started, he, then he would start the rehearsal, and he would just. Orchestra just had to, he had the sense they would see what he was and they would play for him. They loved him. The trick about being an orchestra conductor is: do they can you connect what I said before? Some people get up there and have the most technical ability, look good, and everything else, and the music sounds bad. What's going on? Even though they're playing the music, there's no life to the music. But somebody else get up there, and they don't have to do anything, and the orchestra responds. That's why it's such a, a magical thing to be a conductor. It's a, you know, um, you know, some people don't need to be conducting, but if <laughs> if if you're able to connect, you know, one of my good friends is the worst. I'm not gonna mention his name. One of my good friends is the worst conductor that you ever wanna. I tell him, I said. You can't conduct. It's a wonderful. You can't conduct, but I want to conduct. No, you can't, because he has the the ability to connect. Is 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 not there, but he's a, he's a wonderful composer. <laughs> you I, know, 
<laughs> but, <laughs> but I think that Leonard Bernstein, just his personality and his musicality probably reflects what you heard. <laughs> uh -huh. This reminds me, um, uh, uh, Julius, of what uh, Miles um, was otherwise very <laughs> hard. Uh, um, uh, on uh, on musicians, you uh -huh. tell them when we <laughs> come for an interview. It reminded me of what you just said. Uh -huh. uh, he did not particularly care uh, where they were trained and at what university. Right. He would simply say with his husky voice, "Can you play?" That's <laughs> and 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 we know in the music world. It's unlike a college. They'll say, do you have a PhD? Are you, you know, in the real world? Hey, okay, have you had PhD, DDE, or whatever? The whole thing, can you play? <laughs> That's, uh, I mean, you know, some people, you know, they have all these titles behind it, but the bottom line is, can you play? Otherwise, get out of here. Oh, and yeah. it used to be that, that way in New York, you know, you would come and you think you're a great player and you would come down and you would meet with the, those guys in New York and you sit there, they would do some like giant steps or something. And they would say, go and play. <laughs> and then uh, you would play and they would look at you and they, and somebody would come up to you and say, I think you better leave. <laughs> <laughs> if they ask you to stay and play, they keep on playing. But if they come up, I think you better leave. That you know, that, that, and they can say, "I'm, you know, I'm a PhD from Harvard, or I'm, I went to Juilliard for seven." Well, okay, where you come, you better have to play, and that, and that's the trick with with music. You know? <laughs> and finally, we have about uh, ten minutes left. Let's talk about teaching at Berkeley. How is the teaching going, Julius? Oh, the teaching's going good. You know, when I first came to Berkeley. Uh, 27 years ago, they, you know, I was the only African American. It was only like three in the writing division, too, and I was only in African in in composition in my department. And at first, they came up to me and said, "Oh, well, we you you need to learn about you know how we do conducting and how we do all this, you know, stuff." And I'm looking at them, and I'm saying. And they didn't know that at the time I was uh, brought in by Warwick Carter, just, you know, and I wasn't even going to stay here. I had no desire to be at Berkeley College of Music <laughs> at all. <laughs> I'm still here 27 years later. So they brought me, I said, well, I'll teach the uh, um, semester, because they didn't know, because still the the idea of African-American teaching classical music was still foreign to them. And they were going like, you know, um, and then, then they looked me up and found out all the stuff I did. Then it, you know, it changed. Um, but it's it's been okay. Uh, my only thing is I would like to really get more African American students to understand and be part of you know what I'm doing. Um, I, I've been trying to you know find some some um, younger people, but I have. I, for example, one of my students. Is tough as Zimbabwe, who's the pianist for Saturday Night Live, uh, who was here at Berkeley. Uh, we have a, um, a couple of other students. So, is my before I leave, I want to really try to create a legacy of these, um, you know, African American students following in my footsteps. I hope that that I can do it. That's remarkable, Julius. I wish you well, and I would also like you to um, to consider uh, focusing uh, during your stay at Berkeley, um, many years of stay, so that we can age together, <laughs> to focus on cultivating a female black composer. I've been trying to do, actually, to be honest with you. Well, it's Terry Carrington. Yeah. The, uh, I, I've been, with Terry and I, have been I've you, I've done programs with, with Terry, and we're trying to. I, that's what I not a female, whoever. Yes, um, black really, or white, it doesn't black, matter. Black, black, doesn't matter. I'm trying to do, and I have quite a few students in that genre. Uh, I'm trying to do it in the conductors' guild too. I'm, I have a female uh, um, uh, 
conducting group. Uh, some of them are getting a great job. So I'm I'm really trying to push diverse. Really, my my thing is really to diversify the field to make sure they see that there's a you know that this is not a old. I shouldn't say the old white males uh, thing. This is is uh, people of, of different colors, different nationality, different races, different genders will will um, come and, and, and learn the art and, and be able to lead. And that's the most important thing. Fantastic. This has been a brilliant interview with uh, Julius Wilson from Berkeley College of Music that many describe quite rightly and the standards are rising at the leading college for the study of contemporary music. What an honor it was for me to bring Julius Williams to African Ascent International for the first time, the beginning of a long friendship. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. <laughs>